today we're going to talk about Helgi Bushing. Greg, let's tell us about the videos we're going to watch. So this guy we're going to see is Helgi Bushing, and he was a friend of Christian Bruckner, who is the current leading suspect in the disappearance of Madeleine McCann in, in custody in Germany. When Bruckner was locked up for a burglary or some other crime, Helgi and a friend broke into Bruckner's house, stole a gun and some video equipment. He found some disturbing videos on that tape, but didn't report it. Later, Bruckner confessed info about Madeleine McCann to this guy, to Helgi, and he went to Scotland Yard 10 years ago, said they did nothing. Then he felt guilty at the 10-year anniversary, so he went back and reported it again. We're going to rely mostly on body language in this video because the translation you're going to see, the closed captions, are AI, and they're not reliable. And we will clarify in a few cases, but just realize it may mess up it may mess up pronouns, one of your favorites, Chase, and there may be some other mistakes. That's it. Yeah. So as we go through this, remember, this guy is speaking German. So this is a perfect example of how you can see things from a little bit better from our perspective, because uh, since it's a different language, we're watching body language, even though we, when we do it mostly it's in, in English 99.9% .9 of the time. But you'll be able to pay attention, closer attention to the to the voice and how it speeds up and slows down, the, the how it jacks up in volume and goes down, how how everything changes in there. And you'll see that gut feeling you get. And when people say, How do you know, how do you do whatever? Everybody focuses on what they're saying. This time you're not gonna be able to. Helge B entscheidet nicht zur Polizei zu gehen. Er will sich nicht selbst belasten, meidet aber Brückner ab diesem Moment. Erst ein Jahr später treffen die Männer erneut aufeinander, zufällig auf einem Musikfestival. Ja, und dann hat äh, der Brückner mich dann irgendwann mal gefragt, ja, fährst du nicht mehr nach Portugal und machst da Business? Sag ich, nee, seit das Mädchen da verschwunden ist, äh, fahre ich nicht mehr nach Portugal, weil da sind einfach zu viele Polizeikontrollen und äh, das braucht man ja nun gar nicht, ne, irgendwie, ne. Und ähm, da habe ich gesagt, das verstehe ich sowieso nicht, wie die Kleine da äh, so spurlos äh, verschwinden kann. Ja. Irgendwie sind wir dann auf die gekommen, auf äh, Medi. Ja. Und äh, daraufhin hat der Christian da einen rausgemacht. Er hat ja auch schon zwei, drei Bier getrunken. Das will ich jetzt nicht für ihn als Entschuldigung gelten lassen. Ja. Aber daraufhin hat er dann gesagt, ja, die hat ja nicht geschrien. Und ich habe das aber in dem Augenblick gecheckt, was er da gesagt hat. Ja, ich war bei, bei klarem Sinn und Verstand, was er da gesagt hat. Ja. Jetzt kenne ich seine Vorgeschichte, ja, was ich auf den Videos gesehen habe. Und dann haut er hier so einen raus, wo mir dann ganz elend war, ja. Wo mir dann echt richtig elend war, ja. Right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, look, I guess the overall element that's being looked at here is, is this person a credible witness to anything? Because at some point it's possible that he could appear in court and keep uh, Bruckner uh, in prison um, around the, the Madeleine McCann piece. So I, I guess that's what people are interested in. So that's really what I'll be focusing on. Look, there's a good variety of, of eye contact there or eye movement there. Yes, he does engage the interviewer, but he does go to emotional areas. He does go to pick up his story. So, so that's, that's, that bodes well. Uh, as a good generality for is this person telling us something that might be honest, might be real. He's, he's, uh, in complement to the interviewer, i.e. he's kind of at a 90-degree angle to him, uh, but never turns into him, so he's bladed to them to him. Is that a problem? Uh, I'm thinking somebody, he has a criminal record. He, he did time in Greece for... Uh, for smuggling people, uh, human trafficking, essentially not not a good not a good look. Okay, and this is kind of the problem in that he's he needs to be credible, but he always also doesn't have a good look about him. Uh, so it, that that is kind of what I would expect from somebody who maybe has a record to not really want to confess to people straight on to them. So I'm not too bothered by that. Um, his baton gestures. These are the gestures that conduct along to the rhythm of your speech. His baton gestures on the whole to me seem to be really on point, very credible. Here's the big piece for me. He says, clear to me, no. Um, 
that not clear to me no that not and he slams down slams down he places down his cup you can hear it audibly conducting along audibly to the rhythm of his speech so he's definitive with that and his baton gestures are congruent so straight off the top looks pretty good to me one nice little data point i think he's wearing a rolex daytona uh in solid gold that's a that's a classic look for somebody who's 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 been around, bit of a Jack the Lad, seen some time doing some crime in in Europe. Classic look, solid gold, Rolex Daytona. But do write below if you think that's a fake or if you think uh, I've 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 got it wrong on that. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, let's first start off by I have a good friend named Hayo who's German, and I had him listen to this entire thing because I can't tell the language how good or bad it is. And he said primarily the guy's measured and rehearsed and that he is clearly has something to hide. Of course, there's he's got a whole lot of baggage in that. Felt like every time he responded, it was rehearsed. There are a couple of exceptions. So you'll, you'll hear the same thing without speaking German, but it's always nice to have a person who is a native speaker who knows the normal cadence of the language who can respond just up front. A couple of things to point out. You don't get to know things about bad guys without talking to other bad guys. When you go to organized crime, you go to organized criminals is how you find out information. It's not like Chase or I are going to fit in and go, hey, guys, and suddenly get a ton of information. So you expect that when you're talking to a criminal, you're going to have some other criminal you're going to get information from. That's one of them. One of the more interesting things for me is he talks about avoiding. In the words, he talks about avoiding Bruckner because of X or Y. Well, it's kind of hard to go up and say, hey, man, I broke in your house and I found some disturbing stuff. So he might have been avoiding him simply out of I broke into your house. And I don't want you to know it because he might be violent. Don't know. But think about every time a person says something, what are they hedging and what are they trying to hide? He starts off really good with a whole lot of eye contact and he starts talking about something. But then when he goes to that, those videos, he goes down to some downright and some internal voice downright, meaning emotional accessing internal voice down left. When I'm watching that, I start to feel like, hmm, is there more that he's not saying here? What exactly is it that he's after? Because there's a lot more of the internal voice than there is the emotional eye accessing. And he's adapting with that glass and batoning with a glass as well, Mark. I think it's a really good one. The only thing in here that makes me really uncomfortable is this orphan statement where all of his body language is different from the rest. His eyes go down right when he gets to the story. And one, one key point here, he says, we need to point out that the text says she didn't write. It actually says that she did not scream when he took her out of the apartment. That's what the actual verbiage in this thing is. But the orphan statement in all this from a body language point of view that's different from everywhere else is when he decides to use a provocative statement and elicit that response from Christian Bruckner. By that provocative statement, how could they possibly even this little girl just disappear? That is a provocative statement trying to get Christian Bruckner to do this. My suspicion is it didn't roll out that way. My suspicion is this came out some other way, and that's why he would try to cover as much as he could. After this, he resets his posture, touches his face, and rolls back in his chair. Like first message delivered, I've gotten out what I needed to say in the first one. Looks like distancing. Looks like he's trying to hide something to me, but... There's lots of reasons he could. He's been in prison for human trafficking, in effect, Mark. So how do you go in and say this is a bad guy and I've been human trafficking? Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I tend to agree with with Mark and Greg, both of y'all. And I think there's there's one thing that's incredibly hard to fake, no matter how much training you have, and that is the precise timing of eye contact. And that is a very hard thing to do, even if you're a trained actor. And you'll see him mostly avoidant of eye contact here. And this, I don't think, is uh, demonstrably uh, deceptive. He's displaying these genuine nonverbal behaviors that we typically associate with true feelings of shame. These include him just being hunched over, his voice softening, his kind of avoidant gaze toward the table in front of him, and a large, uh, a lack of large expressive hand movements. And most telling of all is his stillness. There's just stillness there. And it's not rigidity. There's smoothness in the stillness. It's not a matter of self-regulation. Then the moment this point comes up, there's a powerful and direct shift into eye contact and confident behavior. So different, Greg, like you were talking about. And there's just about no way I've ever seen a deceptive person be able to pull that off. And this is 
overall honest behavior here, which doesn't mean he's telling the truth. It means he's exhibiting what we might expect to see in an honest person. And we might might see something different here coming up. Scott, what do you got? You guys got about everything. Uh, so I'll just kind of brush over the big stuff. Um, I think that that deep breath and those deep breaths he's taken, that lets us know he's in deep thought about that stuff. And I agree with you, Chase. I think we're seeing a little bit of, of almost guilt here as he goes through it because I can't figure out what this guy's doing. I know he wants to give the heads up about this bad guy. But on the other hand, you know, why almost incriminate yourself? Because this one guy, I understand you want to get him off the street and get him taken care of and all that. But still, you know, those kind of guys... Birds of a feather flock together. We've all heard that. So I can't figure out what he's getting out of this. And I would assume with a personality like this guy or the kind that he hangs out with, there's something in it for him. I don't know what it what it would be. Maybe some kind of deal he's trying to make. So maybe he's in trouble and hadn't talked about it. And he's going to cut some kind of deal by giving up this information. I have, I don't know. But there, there'll be something in there about that stuff. Uh, he's got a, a lot of facial expressions of concern, and this doesn't change. I think you said that, Mark. It doesn't change throughout these videos. It does, it's just it's almost a solid. We see it a couple of times. We see dramatic changes, but then it goes right back to this this concern. Not a lot of eye contact. Not a lot of hard eye contact. I'll I'll say, uh, like checking and watching, making sure he's believing what he's being told. So I think he's confident in what he's saying. So I agree with you, Chase. I, I think he's showing. Uh, uh, cues of being honest. I'm not saying any deception here. So I think he's being honest about what he's saying, but there's something here because he's he's watching what he says. He's locked down. He's he's making sure he pays attention to exactly everything he says and he structures everything so there's no blame coming back to him. Even though he's seen some things he shouldn't have seen or seen some things that nobody else has seen that were bad, you know, why would why would he be in a position to do that? What kind of guy are we deal with? I think we already assume we know what kind of guy we're dealing with. Uh, his voice tone and cadence they go from that uh, really low and 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 almost monotone to they jack up a little bit and get a little bit higher as he talks more about the details of what happened. So I think that's where he gets excited, and that's the part he's trying to uh, ram home. In other words, to make sure he gets he gets across. Um, I think the clasp, the clasped, clasped hands, and that wa and holding the water. If it's water, is what he's drinking. Like Mark was talking about, how he's he's at an angle to the guy. I think that's sort of a barrier. He's using that that arm and that cup as a barrier as he's talking to the guy because he's looking down this way. He's looking down, so lets us know he's probably dealing with some kind of emotional thing because he's looking straight down. His head is down, which I would think uh, that that would indicate shame from where I'm coming from, from what I'm seeing, from my angle. And um, so he's kind of blocking from that. Not that he's going to be ashamed in front of this guy, but I think he's trying to pay attention and be careful about what he says. He does feel bad about what he's seen, but I still get the feeling something's up here that we are not aware of. Anyway, okay, we good? Yeah. All right. Okay, Mark, I'll give you the first one to lean in there. That was good. Classic lean. That Mark didn't exert any effort for that whatsoever. Well, that's why it's so good. You see, you can't see it coming because you don't see the preparation. One of those tape replays. Helge B. entscheidet, nicht zur Polizei zu gehen. Er will sich nicht selbst belasten, meidet aber Brückner ab diesem Moment. Erst ein Jahr später treffen die Männer erneut aufeinander, zufällig auf einem Musikfestival. Ja, und dann hat der Brückner mich dann irgendwann mal gefragt, ja, fährst du nicht mehr nach Portugal und machst da Business? Sag ich, nee, seit das Mädchen da verschwunden ist, ähm, fahre ich nicht mehr nach Portugal, weil da sind einfach zu viele Polizeikontrollen und ähm, das braucht man ja nun gar nicht, ne, irgendwie. Ne? Und ähm, da habe ich gesagt, das verstehe ich sowieso nicht, wie die Kleine da äh, so spurlos äh, verschwinden kann. Ja? Irgendwie sind wir dann auf die gekommen, auf äh, Medi, ja. Und äh, daraufhin hat der Christian da einen rausgemacht. Er hat ja auch schon zwei, drei Bier getrunken. Das will ich jetzt nicht für ihn als Entschuldigung gelten lassen. Ja. Aber daraufhin hat er dann gesagt, ja, die hat ja nicht geschrien. Und ich habe das aber in dem Augenblick gecheckt, was er da gesagt hat. Ja, ich war bei, bei klarem Sinn und Verstand, was er da gesagt hat. Ja. Jetzt kenne ich seine Vorgeschichte. Ja was ich auf den Videos gesehen habe. Und dann haut der hier so einen raus, 
Wo mir dann ganz elend war, ja. Wo mir dann echt richtig elend war, ja. Zum ersten Mal spricht Helge B. öffentlich über dieses Erlebnis. Der eine Satz wird ihn sein Leben lang begleiten. Die hat ja nicht geschrien. Helge B. behauptet, er habe daraufhin die Polizei informiert. Und das viel früher als bisher bekannt. So, ich habe 2008 Scotland Yard angerufen in England unter der Hotline äh, Maddie McKenn. Und äh, ja, man hat meine Personalien damals aufgenommen, ja, meine Telefonnummer. Und ich habe gesagt, ja, dass ich da jemanden kenne, der da wohl mit was zu tun hat. Ja. Und habe dem Scotland Yard auch äh, den Namen gegeben von diesem Herrn. Ja. Aber da ist halt nichts passiert. Da ist nichts passiert. Man hat mich nie wieder zurückgerufen. Und man hat auch nie den Herrn Brückner daraufhin festgenommen. Und ich habe dann das einfach erstmal sacken lassen, weil ich gedacht habe, naja, die werden sich schon drum kümmern, aber passiert ist am Ende da gar nichts. All right, Chase, what do you got? Every point in this video, there's a display of confidence. And it's precisely when he's explaining very specific details that involve the things he's heard from this other dude. And at the other points, he's displaying a little bit of shame. I don't know the case very well, uh, but this might be because he doesn't or he didn't come forward sooner. This might have been this or maybe it's the effect it's had on his life or he's maybe ashamed of even having his uh, name associated with this person in the first place. So if you look, when this video comes back up, there's a stillness to his body. When people try to fake a somber appearance with shame or remorse, you'll see something kind of like this. But there's two hallmark details that make me very convinced this is a true feeling of shame here. Number one, his hands are relaxed. You can see his fingers clearly on the table. He doesn't make uh, any like squeezing motion to control, to exert control over himself and lock down that body language. Number two, he doesn't make confirmation glances. And this is when we're checking midway or in the middle of us talking to make sure that somebody's believing it. So when someone is faking this stuff, you'll see restraint placed onto their own body. And this happens in the hands and feet becoming more tight and rigid. And as kind of a rule of thumb, the further a body part is away from the head, the harder it is to control during anxiety. Secondly, when somebody's faking a deep level of remorse or any sadness, they'll almost never be able to resist the urge to briefly make that upward look at the interviewer just to make sure that the story is being believed. And we're not seeing that here. Greg, what do you think? Yeah, a couple of things I would point out. However, when you're dealing with criminals, career criminals, they're not like dealing with your neighbor. They're not like dealing with a bad guy soldier, you know, with the enemy soldier. They have mastered skills that average people don't use. That's how they got themselves to where they're at in those situations. So when you're talking to informants, when you're talking to people like that, you have to be cautious that you're not being worked by those guys. So I'm, I'm going to approach this entire interview from that point of view. Did he have more knowledge beforehand than he has let out? Who knows? So let's talk through this and I'll show you a couple of places that as we go through those videos that make me concerned about that. But I agree with you, Chase. He does appear to be comfortable. He does appear to be relaxed more than now when we say relaxed, relatively relaxed, not not jacked up, not his hands down. But I'll also say this. When we put all these guys, all these Green Beret guys through SEER school and we brought them in and put them in subjugation, their testosterone went through the floor and they became compliant. That doesn't happen to career criminals in the system. So what you have to remember is the guy's been in and out and in and out and in and out. He learns a lot of tricks. So let's look for those tricks as we go. He does a lot of, or very little eye contact in the beginning. I think what we're starting to see is the emergence of this guy. And we'll see as he gets more confidence going through when he's trying to make a point, he looks right at the person to make sure they got his point and he moves on. He does little eye contact in the beginning, then emotional eye accessing, looking down into his right. We typically associate that with if you think about a negative moment in your life, you'll find your eyes drifting down into your right, down into his right, down into your right. There's a lot of reasons for emotion because of stuff he's talking about. You see adapters and barriers. This is not a young guy. His legs moving that much is a fair amount of leakage, a fair amount. A, a young guy in his 20s, you see a lot of that. 
but a guy who's probably 50 to 60, you don't see quite as much of it often. He's barriering with his hands folded. That's a containment way, and he might be something he's learned. I believe, however, that he never heard back from Scotland Yard because his eyes are in that kinesthetic and disengaged with you. Usually we'll see a guy darting around down here left and right, but there's not that what I would call the thousand-yard stare, which is disengagement. Watch his eyes disengage as he goes internal. That's a big deal. Then he raises his head and makes hard eye, eye contact as he reinforces that. And there's the verge of this brow, this grief muscle, this little horseshoe arch right through here. We call it the grief muscle because the original guys, Darwin and and, um, and Duchesne called it that. But it's just a cluster of five muscles that create this horseshoe right here. He's right on the edge of that. That does look like grief or shame. Why? We can't really tell that. And right after he says all that, we see a flurry of movement and the short flurry of single shoulders. So I think that's uncertainty about how he's going to be perceived. He does a tongue jut and an intake breath. Maybe it's because he's dealing with the law. And when you're dealing with the law and you've been in trouble, you probably don't want any more trouble. Scott, what do you got? Wait, Greg, can you maybe. educate us when you said going internal, just to kind of yeah. give people an understanding? So I'm sorry, Scott. Yeah, that's, oh, that's a great that's a great question. Look, when I'm talking to you and we're making eye contact and we're talking to each other, that's externally focused. I always talk about energy, direction, and focus. An internal focus means I'm working on something internally, whether or not, and your eyes typically disengage. They disengage making eye contact with the person. They may even look like they're looking at nothing, the thousand-yard stare, because what's happened is all of that processor that they are required to use to figure out what's next or how this is going to be perceived or whatever takes their eyes off out of focus. You don't see it all the time. We don't see it many times in these videos with criminals who are trying to focus on you and have that romance removed. But this guy doesn't do that. You see that and go back internal to his body. Scott, what do you got? Thanks, Chase. Yeah. Great call. Yeah, and, and as far as Chase asking that question, that's the most uncomfortable thing, as you all know, when talking to Dr. Phil, when doing that show, when you just sit there and explain things you know he already knows, but it, you're just like you're telling him. That's so uncomfortable, man, because he looks all interested, like engaged, but you're like, and you want to stop and go, you know, that he, he, he knows this, and it's weird for me to tell him this too. That's always so weird. And sometimes I think about that when, when I'm saying something, like I'm telling you guys stuff. Do you guys get that too, or is it just me? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's weird. Sure. It's always weird. Anyway, yeah, I agree with you. I, I think the behavior someone shows regular old people or a regular old person would show is much different than somebody who's, who's a criminal or who's done time or lives in that world. So we're seeing, that's why we're seeing him be contained. We're seeing him locked down. He's making sure he doesn't say something that gets him in trouble. I think that's a lot of what's on his mind. And he appears to be engaged. His illustrators are all right on time, right where they should be. They're all landing in the right spots. Um, his head shaking and his head nodding, all those things seem to be right in time with what's happening. Those, in this case, don't mean either yes and no. These are just confirmation nods and confirmation shakes as you're saying something. For example, you say, I'm telling you, I went every day this week. doesn't mean I'm, I didn't go. It's just me confirming that by those hitting at the right time. You see that quite often. People say, oh, I shook his head no as he was saying something yes. Those things happen really subtly. You know, if if the person said, I went every day this week. Yes, I did. Then that's different. I'm getting that from Paul Ekman from the studies he did. Anyway, his blink rate's fairly low. So there's there's definitely an issue here because of all the things moving around. But the the blink rate stays so low, I don't think it's it's up in his head where where it's stressing him. I don't think we're seeing the stress from that. We're seeing release stress with some of these adapters, with his legs jiggling and moving around. And like Greg's talking about those adjustments, but I'm, I'm not seeing a lot in, in the, in the blink rate. That doesn't seem to be changing much at all. And um, what else have, have I missed that you guys haven't gotten? Um, I'll move on from there. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Okay. So first thing I know, really from the first video is he doesn't look like he has a strategy for lying, not a grand strategy, not one that you could pick up and go, Oh, I see what you're doing. I see exactly what you're doing. There's nothing big that, okay. Strategy for, for lying. This second video here, I agree with you, uh, Greg, on this idea of nothing happened, you know, the, 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 the British police did not respond to, um, to the information that that he gave and this is an important point because in terms of his credibility if it's not credible that he did try and help out if that's not credible for a start then nothing is credible going on so it's a 
important thing to establish. He says nothing happened. And there is a, what I would say, a methodical nodding of the head, which involves the whole of the body on this. So I would say when he says, look, nothing happened, that that's honest, that's true, which if we work backwards, it's maybe honest and true that he did inform the police of something. Now, just as everybody's saying, is he still withholding some of that? Well, possibly, and there's all kinds of reasons that he'd do it. Now, also, you know, is he just a really good liar? Well, being dishonest will be a day will have been a day to day thing for for him. You, you, there is no honor amongst thieves. He will break into his friend's, you know, apartment caravan and take stuff. <laughs> you know, that's that's you know, and having worked with people who are career criminals, yet yeah, they will show petty, you know, in some cases petty, as he's been described as petty career criminals. I wouldn't quite class him as that. S smuggling people is is not in that realm, but in 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 the realm of like entering, you know, daily entering people's homes and walking off with goods. Yeah, they do that on a daily basis. I would have I would be working with people and they would come in with a suitcase full of stuff. And it wasn't theirs. And and that was nothing, nothing to them. That's just daily stuff, daily work, like you and I do our daily work as well. It's nothing to them. So look, being dishonest can be water off a duck's back to somebody like this. However, look, there are strong, consistent, prolonged patterns of behavior from him. Whatever he's doing, it goes on for a while and it stays for a while. He isn't erratic with things. He's relatively fluid and consistent. Uh, now, also, you might go, well, hang on, though. Yeah, Noah, honor among thieves. But I mean, you know, he's accusing somebody or has accused somebody of something, a very, very serious crime here you know abduction um uh uh ab abuse um serious serious crimes well look what i understand and have experienced with the criminal group is when it comes to sex offenders all bets are off if you're a sex offender then you are a target for the criminal group unless you're in that group of sex offenders. And so there's every reason why if he sees somebody who he believes is part of that group, he is justified as being part of his group to come in, attack and take that person down. So it isn't unusual to see somebody from that criminal group uh, attack this other criminal group. And in a very, very strong way, that would be seen as, um, well, a good move from from his you know criminal group to take somebody down of that nature uh there that's all i got on that one one of those tape replays zum ersten mal spricht helge b öffentlich über dieses erlebnis der eine satz wird ihn sein leben lang begleiten die hat ja nicht geschrien helge b behauptet er habe daraufhin die polizei informiert und das viel früher als bisher bekannt so ich habe 2008 scotland yard angerufen in england unter der Hotline äh, Maddie McKenn. Und äh, ja, man hat meine Personalien damals aufgenommen, ja, meine Telefonnummer und ich habe gesagt, ja, dass ich da jemanden kenne, der da wohl mit was zu tun hat, ja. Und habe dem Scotland Yard auch äh, den Namen gegeben von diesem Herrn, ja. Aber da ist halt nichts passiert. Da ist nichts passiert. Man hat mich nie wieder zurückgerufen und man hat auch nie den Herrn Brückner daraufhin festgenommen. Und ich habe dann das einfach erstmal sanken lassen, weil ich gedacht habe, na, die werden sich schon drum kümmern, aber passiert ist am Ende da gar nichts. 2008 also will Helge B. die Polizei zum ersten Mal informiert haben. Sollte Scotland Yard tatsächlich zehn Jahre früher eine Spur zu Brückler gehabt haben, ohne ihr nachzugehen? Erst 2017, beinahe zehn Jahre später, wendet sich Helge B. erneut an die Polizei. Also diese Kontaktaufnahme kam nach meiner Entlassung äh, in, äh, in äh, Lamia, habe ich dann, dann gewohnt. Äh, das ist auf dem griechischen Festland. Dort habe ich dann gewohnt. Und diese Kontaktaufnahme kam dann, als ich... Äh, 
als ich gehört habe von dem zehnjährigen Jubiläum. Im, ich weiß nicht mehr, ich glaube, ich habe das auf YouTube geguckt, ist ja eigentlich ein trauriges Jubiläum, aber das war dann halt das zehnjährige Jubiläum. Was mir dann wieder das in den äh, Kopf gebracht hat, ähm, also damals mein Anruf bei Scotland Yard 2008 hat da eigentlich gar nichts genutzt. Ja. Und ich war aber schon entlassen ja, und habe dann äh, außer, also von Griechenland aus das Scotland Yard kontaktiert. Nochmals, ja. So, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm not, this one I'll be pretty short on. If, again, if he's done bad guy stuff, which he has, he was in Lamia when he's talking about being in Greece for human trafficking. Yeah, he's one of the bad guys, and so we're getting information. I had a buddy one time who was a undercover cop in New York for like 20 years, Puerto Rican guy, and this guy could talk anybody out of anything. And I asked him, how did you learn that? He said, it's how I stayed alive. So when you're dealing with people like that and you're not one of them, you have to learn how to behave like them. And people end up in trouble a lot of times because what you, I always say, fish tastes like what it swims in. And those guys have to be very careful. They don't turn into people they're with. Anyway, as he's talking about this 10th anniversary, he has new levels of illustrators. I mean, a whole lot more illustration than he had otherwise. And then one of the single best displays of grief, I think I've seen in a long time, that withdrawn chin and the chin boss engage. It is either shame, remorse, or both a combination. Then he goes back down to to his, his own right, back down to that emotional eye accessing. And who knows why? I mean, there's can be all kinds of reasons. Hey, I wish I'd stayed on it. Hey, I have other information that could cause something. Even if he didn't feel remorse or emotion years ago, he certainly feels it now when he's thinking about this. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, I agree with you there, Greg, and I was going to do exactly the same gesture. Uh, when he talks about the 10th anniversary, he does a rotational gesture. Uh, again, totally congruent, totally congruent. So again, makes me feel like he's not making up this idea of the 10th anniversary, because why have the rotational gesture, you know, there? You yep. wouldn't, it's not something you'd imagine doing. I'll say, okay, I'll talk about the 10th anniversary and I'll do this gesture. Totally congruent. So so that, that bodes well for him. Um, uh He's 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 very uh, open. What I notice about his language as well, or intonation, my German is not good in any way whatsoever. However, my own English language is derived from German. Okay, so we we have similar intonations as well. There is a lot of downward intonation there, which which bodes well. Now, different languages have have different uh, intonations, which can create different meaning to the same, um, same sonics that are going on. But this persistent downward intonation, knowing enough about how English is derived from from Germanic, bodes well that he's giving us clear instruction as to what went on rather than asking us questions about it and seeing whether we're buying this idea. He doesn't seem to need us to buy this story, which again, looks good. It got me thinking, he says, and he points to his mind again. It points towards his head. Again, congruent, seems good. No gestures that I've seen so far are outside of what I'd call second circle. So I, I, I suggest that when people are gesturing and they've always got their uh, arms or some limbs or some fingers or something attached to their body in some way, I'll say, okay, so they're gesturing in first circle. Okay, and and it, it'll always look, you know, a bit barriered or a bit protective. Second circle for me is you get some space under here and you, you don't get any part of the arm or the hands or the limb touching the rest of the body. Third circle is when those those limbs lock out. And we've seen people before who when they're when they're, uh, you know, uh, gesturing about the story, they're doing illustrators, they go right out of the frame. So I, at that point, I know, well, you've probably gone certainly outside of second circle, you might even be hitting third circle. Now, it's a bit like that kind of the Truvian man, you know, it's, it's reached out uh, completely. Uh, nothing, nothing into third circle, which again means he's not trying to convince us 
of this story. Now, look, to to, to everybody's point so far, maybe he's a good enough of, of a career criminal that he's realised, well, you never get anywhere convincing somebody of the story. you got to be light with it. you got to... But he has, for me, this air of, and I'd love other people's view on this, this air of confession to him. There are the hands in front of him. The body is down. There's a there's a sense of 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 being not not slumped in total protection, but this is the last move. He's got no other move to make. This is the confession move. Again, could be a great career criminal and he's and he's thinking, you know, wouldn't it be fun to increase uh, Christian uh, Bruckner's time in prison and make up a story around this. It's a possibility, but so far he doesn't seem to show the behaviours that I would want to see of somebody trying to convince me of a story that isn't true. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I think you nailed it on that part. He's not trying to convince him of anything. He's, he's just telling him, he's just talking at this point to what happened. And I think that goes back as well. We can see that as he's looking down, thinking his eyes are, are jetting around as he's going through these things he's seen. I think he's in his mind's eye going over these things he's seen and and um, have, has talked about. At the same time, I think he's structuring what he says, being very careful about the way he delivers. And he's, he's still, uh, as Greg always says, he's contained you know, and the guy, the look of the guy, you know, the guy has a little scar right there. He looks mean. In other words, when you when you walk in and talk to somebody like that, you go, oh, here we go. This could, yeah, this could, this is probably a rough one. But he seems fairly mellow. You know, he, he seems, um, he doesn't seem violent or anything, but he has that that movie look to him where he looks mean. We see that leg jiggling and, and the fidgeting. That goes way up compared to what we've seen so far. It's It's dramatically increased. And uh, that deep swallow before he starts talking, and a little bit before that, he squirms, squirms around a little bit, and he gets that quick uh, head to the left there to, you know, be your right and the left. Anyway, it's quick head jab there to the left. I think he's trying to make a point there. I think he's 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 ramming home. In other words, I've said that before. What he's saying, he's making sure that that point gets across. Um, the confirmation nods let us know that is uh, called the police. That was a big deal for him. You know, and I don't think that worked out. And I think that that bothers him. So, again, I'm already I'm not biased. I'm just saying these kind of this type of person, they, they hang out together. So I'm I'm pretty sure he's not the greatest guy in the world. But for that to bother him, it must be really bad. Oops, excuse me. It must be really bad what this guy's done if he's trying to tell what happened. Yeah, it must. He must think this guy is really bad. So I, I think that's where he's trying to get across a there. Uh, we see a, a little bit of adapting with that left thumb on his right hand uh, while he's talking. He's trying to get some of that rid of some of that built up stress and tension. He doesn't look that stressed. I mean, he looks stressed because he looks like he's worried and he looks a, a little concerned, but he doesn't look like he's worried about anything. Like he doesn't keep locking eyes with the guy like we were talking about before. And the lowered head when he's answering all those questions. That's almost it's so low. It's almost eye blocking. It goes down so far uh, when he's when he's talking about that as well. Um, and I, try, I think he's trying to. I don't know if he's trying to sell this guy this stuff because he the, the interviewer is so receptive to what's going on. And you look at him, you go, "Wow, that guy's really into what's happening." And in, in a couple of minutes, you're going to see him start mirroring um, Helgi. You see him start mirroring him. So, or, yeah, mirroring and matching. So that I think that's fairly interesting. But the the, the uh, interviewer looks really into what's happening. We talked about that uh, in the in the break earlier. Um, so I think what I think he feels like he's getting his point across. Not that he's you know overdoing it, but I think he feels like at least he, he's being listened to at this point. But still, I got the feeling there's something in it for him. I don't know what. Again, that's I'm not being biased. I'm just saying. That personality type, those kind of guys hang out together, and he's admitted to hanging out with the other guy. So I can't imagine he'd be doing something without there something being something in it for him. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. I don't think this is 100% altruistic where he's just kind of giving himself. Uh, and most people would, would – most people would probably do something because there was some kind of gain uh, for themselves, especially this, because it's a, he's destroying his life for it. And there's no prominent real clusters in this video because we we talk about that a lot. One thing we do see is a continuation of these spikes in confidence 
every time he's conveying information he thinks is important to the issue. And this is about seeing the 10th anniversary on YouTube and it being such a sad event. And the translation is a little poor here. Uh, so I'd feel a little bit irresponsible and maybe not a real expert if I started diving into these topics here. And one of the things that I always teach here is the five C's and why they're important. And those five C's are change, context, clusters, culture, and checklist. So changes in behavior, this is once we know a baseline, how they behave normally, we look for changes to that. And these are in order of importance, according to me. I don't know if the guys agree or not, but context is next. This is all about the situation. Just because somebody's acting a bit off doesn't mean that they're lying. Things like circumstances, people in the room, cameras being there, all that stuff is very important to take into account what's going on. Then we have clusters. So we need to look for patterns and these little clumps of behavior. So let's see one little stressful behavior, you're probably not seeing very much. You, these things tend to happen in clusters and, and pairs. And culture is there. You've got to remember to take culture into account. For instance, avoiding eye contact in some cultures is just is a sign of respect. It's not a red flag. So culture can be anything from a family, a small family culture. Greg talks about this on a regular basis. It's just a microculture uh, where these idiosyncratic behaviors are pretty common. It could become a, a culture inside of a prison where people start behaving certain ways or an, an entire region of the world or a country can be a culture. And finally, we have this checklist and kind of like a, maybe a guidebook. And these are just the common signs that people are showing uh, when they might not be being straight with us. What are the most common things we're likely to see? And that would be the checklist. So remember, the checklist is just one part of the piece. And in this, there's a translation mix up. And it's about him reassuring that he's the one who contacted Scotland Yard. So if you read that in the uh in the closed caption stuff, that was the mix up in, in this particular clip. And we'll get into that later. That's all we got. All right. Since you brought the 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 C's and, and and what order they be in, everything, as you know, here's that thing where I feel like I'm talking down to you, but I'm not. Uh it, when you deal with any kind of body language, you deal with you decide whether you're seeing something that's limbic or you see something that's cultural. So so maybe scoot the cultural up some. Towards that, because that's really where that's that's the way I approach it anyway, is is the limbic and cultural. So and then down from there, I don't know what you think. No, about I take that? the other approach. I say we all are capable of exactly the same movements, unless culture says don't do that, and it changes mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Well, contact context dictates our permission to do different things. Yep. Yeah. Like oh, I yeah, can strip take down it. naked in front of a shower. I'm not going to do it in the middle of a shopping mall or an airport. But that's not the culture. That's context that dictates permission. Yeah, that's a good call. Yep. A lot of yeah, behavior. Yeah. You have to take everything in what's happening and put it in context with what's happening in real time. In other words, yeah, it's like Joe Navarro. I'm, that's another one. I always feel like I'm ripping him off every time I open my mouth. Well, but and I mean, Joe Navarro's well. taking it from uh, uh, Hans Scharf. Hans Scharf. Yeah. Well, and, yeah. and guys, the first, the first guy, the first guys will go back and say, Back to Darwin, back to Duchesne in the 1860s, published a book about all this stuff. The yeah. things we talk about with grief muscle, the things we talk about with smiles, that's, they were talking about this in the 1860s. So, yeah, we're standing on other people's shoulders, but other people are standing on yours, too. So just and then play as long as we stick to it. And like yeah, 100 yeah. A.D. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, yeah. right. Well, and, and in 1962, we you know, a lot of us are leaning on Desmond Morris. A lot of us. Chase, you talked Desmond Morris earlier about not. It's harder to control the hands than the face. That's Desmond Morris 101, right? It's if cool you get stuff. a chance, go go through and Google uh, Duchesne de Bologna, and then as it, and what it does is it shows him taking he's the, he's taking pictures of this guy called the old man, and he's and he's like putting these little electric uh, things on his face so his muscles contract and let go and contract and let go. But when you do that, <laughs> look at his hands, man. They're nasty. I don't know what this cat was doing, man, but his hands are absolutely nasty. I don't know well, why. Every time I see that. That's why. The, it could be. It could be. Which, which guy? You're talking about the doctor? Duchesne. The, yeah. 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 Well, the, like the he said, he's got, he's okay, got his, he's doing, he's doing Voltaire's batteries. Oh. It's like, 
They're in battery acid yeah. most of the time. He's fried. This them. is dirt, though, man. You can see it. It's dirt. It's nasty. It's dead skin, and every time probably, I show yeah. a slide like that, every time I show a slide like that and during training, I look at that and I want to say, can you believe how nasty this guy's hands are? Because he puts himself in the in the in the pictures. He's right beside the old man as he's doing it all, you know. And you can see his hands. Go Google that. And look up his hands. They're nasty. Well, maybe he was an avid gardener. <laughs> yeah, maybe, it could be. Best, yeah, maybe best, he was. He was just running. Best flowers in Boulogne. <laughs> <laughs> One of those tape replays. 2008, also, will Helge B. die Polizei zum ersten Mal informiert haben. Sollte Scotland Yard tatsächlich zehn Jahre früher eine Spur zu Brückler gehabt haben, ohne ihr nachzugehen? Erst 2017, beinahe zehn Jahre später, wendet sich Helge B. erneut an die Polizei. Also diese Kontaktaufnahme kam nach meiner Entlassung äh, in, äh, in äh, Lamia, habe ich dann, dann gewohnt. Äh, das ist auf dem griechischen Festland. Dort habe ich dann gewohnt. Und diese Kontaktaufnahme kam dann, als ich, äh, als ich gehört habe von dem zehnjährigen Jubiläum. Im, ich weiß nicht mehr, ich glaube, ich habe das auf YouTube geguckt. Ist ja eigentlich ein trauriges Jubiläum, aber... Das war dann halt das zehnjährige Jubiläum. Was mir dann wieder das in den äh, Kopf gebracht hat, ähm, also damals mein Anruf bei Scotland Yard 2008 hat da eigentlich gar nichts genutzt. Ja. Und ich war aber schon entlassen ja, und habe dann äh, außer, also von Griechenland aus das Scotland Yard kontaktiert. Nochmals, ja. Doch dieses Mal geht Scotland Yard im Hinweis nach. Es kommt zu einem Treffen, zu Ermittlungen und schließlich zum Prozess. Helge B. ist Zeuge. Aufgrund seiner Aussage wird Christian Brückner zu sieben Jahren Haft verurteilt. Für Helge B. der Beginn eines ganz persönlichen Dramas. Also ich habe nicht damit gerechnet, welche Dimensionen das überhaupt annimmt. Das war mir eigentlich nicht so klar. Und ich glaube, ich würde es heute nicht noch einmal machen. Ich würde das heute... Wenn ich sowas glaube, ich wüsste, ich würde es nicht nochmal machen. Weil es hat ja mein Leben auch ruiniert. Ja. Ich war eigentlich da, wo ich war, sehr glücklich gewesen. Ich hatte meine Arbeit, ich hatte keine Sorgen. Zumindest finanziell nicht. Und äh, das war dann auch einmal alles weg. Ja. Wie ist das? Warum war das plötzlich auf einmal alles weg? Ja, weil halt irgendwelche Leute bei mir vor der Tür gestanden haben, weil Leute bei mir auf der Arbeit waren. Und es wusste ja keiner auf der Arbeit. Nachher haben das äh, dann meine Nachbarn mitbekommen, die dann natürlich auch nicht gut auf mich zu sprechen sind. Ja. Was, äh, wieso kennt derjenige so einen Typen? Ja, ja das frage ich mich dann heute manchmal auch noch. Ja. Und dann kann ich das jetzt nun mal nicht mehr. Das heißt, da hat sie ihre Vergangenheit eingeholt. Ja, der größte Fehler meines Lebens, ja. Der größte so. Fehler, Entschuldigung. Der ja. größte Fehler meines Lebens, dass ich halt diese Videos mitgenommen habe. Am liebsten hätte ich mir gewünscht, ich hätte davon nichts gewusst, ja. Auf der anderen Seite, auf der anderen Seite haben Sie damit möglicherweise, wer weiß es, ist noch nicht ganz absehbar, aber möglicherweise zur Auflösung eines der spektakulärsten Kriminalfälle der Welt beigetragen. Also Sie sind derjenige, der es ausgelöst hat. Ja, stolz bin ich nicht drauf. Nee. Selbst wenn es mal zu einer Verurteilung kommen sollte. Nee. Stolz bin ich nicht drauf. Hi, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so uh, I'm not proud of it either. Um, so he he doesn't use this opportunity. So there's an opportunity here for him to elevate himself because you know he's he's given evidence to police. He's 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 done his best. He's he's uh, pointing the finger at uh, Bruckner for for uh, you know a crime that uh, is one of the biggest crimes that we've ever come across or mysteries that we've ever come across. Uh, he says, I'm not proud of it either. So he's not using the opportunity to elevate himself. That is odd for somebody who's trying to be uh, deceptive, make up stories, 
um, and, and has a you know which which uh, and or, or has a narcissistic complex and wants to use this uh, opportunity. He says uh, he's never been uh, given any money for this. There is no other. There's nothing in it for him other than altruism. I agree that probably there may be some other aspects in there. Um, you know, now he's been seen to give evidence against somebody in his community, shall we call it. Uh, that doesn't bode well for him because he won't have any friends in that community or outside of that community because, you know, he, he talks to police and that's that's never seen as a good thing. Um, however, so within all of that, What's interesting for me is he, when he takes that drink of of water. I think it it is it is water that he's drinking there, um, and and exactly how he drinks that and when he drinks that, I would sense that that is anger. Uh, th there's a resolve in the water drinking, uh, but I think there's anger there as well. He's using the water as a as a barrier essentially, or as a comfort or something to help him moderate those feelings of anger in him around this situation. He's, he's, he's a big guy. He's a, you know, he's Dutch big. Uh, you know, he's, he's, he's big. He's got that upper body strength. Uh, we, he's, he's scarred. Uh, he will have seen violence in his time. Uh, I imagine he's able to dish out some violence and maybe able to moderate it when he needs to. Uh, I think he could control it. If he couldn't control it, he'd have been in prison a lot more than he has been, from what I understand. So I think that water drinking his, is his control of anger. Go back, look at it, see whether you think I'm right on that. Uh, Scott, what you got on this one? All right. Uh, I think we're seeing the most head move that we've seen so far. And... Um... His cadence is really fast compared to what it's been. It is slowing down. It's speeding up. Right here, it's getting a little quick as he's going through this. His eyes are darting everywhere. So I think there's there may be an issue here. We're still getting a lot of those deep breaths, plenty of those. And I think I think that cup you're talking about, Mark, I, I agree with you. I think he's using it almost as a prop to, to sit there and give his hands something to do, which, of course, ends up being an, an adapter. And he's still uh, sort of barrier, barrier, barrier ring with his arm. At the same time, so there's, there's. I think he's glad he's got that cup. It gives him something to do, something to look like he's focusing on. Gives him that the classic lean forward with you know, he can look into the cup, or look at the cup. Give him something to do as he's talking. So it's it's not as weird. He's just looking at the at the ground or the table. Um, and this is where the interviewer starts mirroring, because when uh, Helg Helgi sits back, then the interviewer sits back as well. I don't know if he's doing that on purpose. I don't. I don't think he is. I think he's naturally doing it because there's that there's that little. A pause in there. Usually, when somebody's mirroring someone or matching and mirroring, you'll see it happen a lot faster than this kind of thing. But it, but the flow seems to go well. There were some studies done in the late '60s, early '70s, where they would uh, film families eating, and they would all all of a sudden start moving almost in concert with each other. Somebody would move this way, and somebody else would move, and you could see this flow happening. There and I think that's what we're seeing in this is this is this flow happening between them because this interviewer he looks like he's listening to him, you know he's he's squinted he's forward he's he's got his hand on his um, on his chin part of the time listening and he covers his mouth so letting him know he's not going to interrupt so he can keep speaking which is, I think is a great tool for a lot of interviewers uh, so if you're interviewing people out there you might want to try that but. It, it it seems to flow very well. So I think the guy's a pretty good interviewer, and he's he's really uh, committed to getting uh, some information from this guy without poking too hard. I think again, no hard eye contact, um, but the contact uh, is there. But it's not again, it's not the type where he's making sure that he's being believed. He's just looking at him and, and making sure they're they're connecting. You know, that's the only thing he's making sure of. I think at that point, um, at the beginning. Uh, he looks like he's listening, um, the the interviewer. But then uh, going back to what I was talking about earlier, watch him just slowly go into this thing where he that's where he starts covering his mouth um, to to make sure he knows he's not going to be interrupted. Uh, what else have I got you guys in covered so far? Um, oh yeah, at the beginning there we see several little quick shoulder shrugs while he's talking. I think it's because he's he's again watching what he says. You know. 
he's 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 very contained. So he's he's I think he's a little worried about what he's saying. So when he starts talking, that shoulder pops up a little bit. Not that he's not being honest. Not that he's being you know deceptive. It's just I think he's being uh, he's unsure because maybe he didn't uh, get it, he didn't have that answer prepared. A lot of this stuff looks prepared almost in an odd way, but I don't think this this. Uh, this section of it was if if a lot of it is prepared but i get the feeling a lot of this is prepared he's thought through this one i'm going to say what can't i say say if i'm going to talk about this i've got to leave this part out so i think we're seeing a lot of things uh missing from some of this stuff so he doesn't incriminate himself um and i think the tongue jet there uh, toward the end that's just uh just an adapter i don't think there's any he's not hearing something maybe he's he's uncomfortable from what from what the guy's asking him but i think it's just because he does it several times throughout these videos and, and I don't think it's that big a deal. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, Mark, I do agree with you. I think that's anger in the very end. I'm going to run through a few things. That's anger. And I think that anger is partially caused by the interviewer making this seem like he's being a good guy and not being able to read his source. If I were talking to this guy, I wouldn't go, oh, well, you did that. Did, 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 did. Mm -hmm. When you already see the guy is irritated because you see his fight or flight increase. And I'm going to go backward in backward order on this one, but you can't miss that his fight or flight increases because his respiration increases and his jaw sets. That shows me that there's fight or flight going on. He fidgets a little more. I would think there's anger. And I think the water is a way to slam and control it. I agree. It's a sudden move. I also think when you're in fight or flight, it's a good way to contain some of that because mucous membranes dry out and all that kind of thing. So I think this interviewer would have done well not to say, well, you're going to contribute to goodness of society because something is up that causes him to feel that way. If you listen, I'm going to tell you two different things you'll see. If you watch this interview, Scott, I agree, this is not rehearsed. This is him speaking and he's telling and he's got downward intonation and he's rolling along and his body language is saying it and his eyes are saying it and everything's saying it. When we're listening to him talk about the video and the things he found, it was camped and controlled and that it was control release. He's trying to ensure he doesn't release a detail that causes him grief. There's another really interesting thing. Just watch this. Remember we said earlier that probably in his style is once I make a point, I look at you and make sure you got it. That's not a hard, hey, I'm worried about what you think. It's, hey, Chase, you understand what I mean, right? Boom, that's it. That's all you have to do. He does that when he's talking here. He did not do that earlier. He did not do that when he's disclosing this information. And then the single most important thing he said in this entire thing, let me back up first. Scott, I'm surprised you didn't mention his fading facts. When he talks about his life imploding, he throws it away. That's the way it should be. If I'm saying, my life is gone, that sounds awkward. If I go, my life is gone, that sounds real. And so it's one of those cases where a fading fact should be there. Then the single most important thing, and it's a source lead and it's missing here. There's when, when you're talking to a person and they do something that's this out of the norm, stop and ask what they mean. He's rattling along. He's telling the story, he's saying this happened and this happened. Everything was good financially. Look at him when he says financially. He says things were going well, at least financially. Chin drops, covers his throat. Tone and cadence shift by tone. We mean, you all know what that means. It's not what you said. It's how you said it. Listen to the tone of his voice change. Listen to that cadence shift. I don't have to speak German to know something changed in his head and something changed in his voice. There's a deep swallow right at the end of it. And then there's kind of a grimace as he pulls it back, his, the sides of his mouth back. All when he said, at least financially. Hmm. Why did we let that pass? Well, because that's not what interviewers do. But if you're interrogating, you want to know. If all's good, then what wasn't would be my question. What happened? I think this is a crux of the story. There could be other people involved. There could be somebody discovered that he knew something he didn't. Who knows? But something's here. Something's big in this one that we will find out at some point, whether he knows more than he's letting on yet yeah. or something else. It rolls out here. And then he leans back again and does, that's it. It's beautiful. You can't miss this. This is the single most important video. I think we'll find that he is hiding facts. Chase, what do you got? I don't know what the hell I'm supposed to say after you guys covered all that stuff. Um, uh, I want to share something with you while you're watching this uh, that I think will really help you forever. And you can screenshot it if Scott can put a graphic up right here. Hopefully the graphic is up here on your screen. Now, I mentioned baseline in the last video. So let's talk about it really fast. 
what baseline are we actually seeing here in this situation? If you're watching this at home, you can draw this out. You can draw the two giant big plus signs here or an X, Y axis. On the left side, this is the nonverbal baseline, smooth, confident on top and insecure and stiff on the bottom. And the left, right axis, there's opening and revealing on the left and then closing and protecting out on the right. So now on the right diagram, this is verbal baseline. How do they communicate? The vertical axis should have revealing on top and concealing down on the bottom. And on the left side of that axis is focused, like focused on a subject, and then vague on the right side. So the baseline we're seeing here in these videos is nonverbal. He's being smooth and confident, but closed and protecting. So we were looking for maybe some deviations to that. And on the verbal side, we'll be seeing focused communication that's also revealing uh, most of the time. So where his language is just specific and focused on one topic. So think of this uh, like revealing access is how vulnerable somebody's willing to be. And the only translation error here in this video, and I did have it translated for you, uh, he repeats that he's not proud again uh, in this video. One of those tape replays. Doch dieses Mal geht Scotland Yard im Hinweis nach. Es kommt zu einem Treffen, zu Ermittlungen und schließlich zum Prozess. Helge B. ist Zeuge. Aufgrund seiner Aussage wird Christian Brückner zu sieben Jahren Haft verurteilt. Für Helge B. der Beginn eines ganz persönlichen Dramas. Also ich habe nicht damit gerechnet, welche Dimensionen das überhaupt annimmt. Das war mir eigentlich nicht so klar. Und ich glaube, ich würde es heute nicht äh, noch einmal machen. Ich würde das heute, wenn ich sowas glaube, ich wüsste, ich würde es nicht noch einmal machen. Weil es hat ja mein Leben auch ruiniert. Ja. Ich war eigentlich da, wo ich war, sehr glücklich gewesen. Ich hatte meine Arbeit, ich hatte keine Sorgen. Zumindest finanziell nicht. Und äh, das war dann auch einmal alles weg. Ja. Wie ist das? Warum war das plötzlich auf einmal alles weg? Ja, weil halt irgendwelche Leute bei mir vor der Tür gestanden haben, weil Leute bei mir auf der Arbeit waren. Und es wusste ja keiner auf der Arbeit. Nachher haben das äh, dann meine Nachbarn mitbekommen, die dann natürlich auch nicht gut auf mich zu sprechen sind. Ja. Mit was, äh, wieso kennt derjenige so einen Typen? Ja, ja das frage ich mich dann heute manchmal auch noch. Ja. Und dann kann ich das jetzt nochmal nicht mehr. Das heißt, da hat sie ihre Vergangenheit eingeholt? Ja, der größte Fehler meines Lebens, ja. Der größte so. Fehler, Entschuldigung. Der ja. größte Fehler meines Lebens, dass ich halt diese Videos mitgenommen habe. Am liebsten hätte ich mir gewünscht, ich hätte davon nichts gewusst, ja. Auf der anderen Seite, auf der anderen Seite haben Sie damit möglicherweise, wer weiß es, ist noch nicht ganz absehbar, aber möglicherweise zur Auflösung eines der spektakulärsten Kriminalfälle der Welt beigetragen. Also Sie sind derjenige, der es ausgelöst hat. Ja, stolz bin ich nicht drauf. Nee. Selbst wenn es mal zu einer Verurteilung kommen sollte. Nee. Stolz bin ich nicht drauf. Doch Helge B. ist sich nach wie vor sicher. Christian Brückner hat die kleine Medi entführt. Also das ist jetzt meine Theorie. Meine. Ich kann, werde das, kann das ja dem Christian ähm, jetzt äh, nicht ähm, unterstellen. Er ist ja in der Hinsicht noch unschuldig. Meine Theorie ist... Äh, dass er einen Einbruch vorhatte und äh, das halt irgendwie schief gegangen ist und er die Kinder halt im Apartment gefunden hat und das halt mir die mitgenommen hat. Das ist meine Theorie. Das war wahrscheinlich gar nicht geplant. Davon gehe ich mal stark aus, dass es nicht geplant war. Es war halt ein Zufall. Sie Kennen, Sie kannten ihn ja, Sie haben dann diese Videos gesehen. Trauen Sie ihm so eine Tat zu, so eine Zufallstat? Ja, also so eine Tat würde ich ihm auf jeden Fall zutrauen, nachdem ich, nachdem jetzt, was ich alles über ihn weiß, ja, 
kann ich ihm seine Tat auch zutrauen. Ja. Hello, Mike, what do you got? Yeah, so I'm going to go for some of the text here. Chase will give you a way uh, later on where you can get a, a decent transcription of, of this. But I'm going to go into what I think is being said here or inferred here uh, by uh, Bushing that he sus suspects Bruckner of poor impulse control and being able to turn coincidence into opportunity and into crime. So this is juxtaposed with, I think, uh, uh, Helga here, who, who, is, who is able to control himself quite well. Uh, I think you're right, Greg. In that previous video, we have anger. We have anger because you've got a, you've got an interviewer going, "Yeah, but you're a great guy. You're a great guy," and and he doesn't want to be told what his feelings are about anything or whether he's done something morally right because ultimately he he is informing to to police, and that gives him no friends whatsoever. But he's able to control those impulses and we know he's able to control his impulse because he's a big guy and yes he has been convicted of violent acts but not as many as you would be convicted on if you were a weren't able to control that violence in my uh opinion uh so he looks down i think on the person who has poor impulse control what can we know about this person with poor impulse control well it's very similar to other um, criminals that we've come across, where they're able to turn a an an opportunity that presents itself, not necessarily premeditated, but an opportunity that presents itself, which uh, is reminiscent of a fantasy fantasy situation that they have, and turn that immediately into an act because they don't have that part of their psyche that would say, no, no, hang on. Just keep that as a fantasy. It's not right that you turn that into an actual physical thing right now. Don't do the act. Poor impulse control. That's all I got on this one. But I think it's it's interesting that he's able to come up with, um, what would we say, a psychology, a motivation for the other actor in this. And somebody making this up, I don't think would have the foresight to come up with here's the psychology of i think think uh, that i think is happening here uh greg what do you got on this one yeah and mark i think what he may be doing is taking away some of the evil from the guy just my opinion by taking away some of those attributes when he he goes out of his way i don't know how many times you say my four something like that my theory my theory this is yeah. mine he says that, i mean you don't have to speak german to know that he just goes and says over and over and over, mine, mine, mine. So when we get to that, he's now saying, look, this guy had poor impulse control. He didn't go there to steal this girl. This happened as. That may be a chance to remove some of the monster from the abductor because we've already established that he's one with him, that, he, that they're friends, that they're acquaintances. And it's already cost him a lot. Then, however, given the chance, he pushes himself away from him entirely when he says, but... So, Mark, I think you're right. He's saying what he thinks. He's saying, but once I knew who he really was, I stopped associating with him. And he pushes himself away from it. And you can't miss the body language there as he's getting demonstrative again. Yeah. And that becomes powerful. We see one of the, the single most congruent yes messages, everything all going at the same time, his head and all of that. When he's asked, "Would does he think that Christian Bruckner would dare video more than the attacks he saw? He goes, yes. Hmm. That's a lot of emphatic yes. That's a lot of body language going in line, congruent, saying, yes, I believe he did that. Is he Has he seen something he's not telling us? That's the question I would ask right here if I were sitting across the table. This could be key evidence that the prosecutor cited. Remember, there's a reason that the Germans are saying, I don't think the German court system is liable to come out and broadcast something to the world saying we've got the abductor and we're certain of X. That's awfully bold without any kind of evidence that we haven't seen. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, and I think one thing, if I'm ever doing an interview with a person and I hear judgment come out, like, Mark, you were talking about this impulse control, this lack of impulse control. If I'm doing an interview and I hear some kind of judgment come out, I always wonder what that person's shadow is, because we tend to judge people from our own shadow a lot. 
and most people, judgment comes from something that we're suppressing, something we're ashamed of in ourselves, something we don't like about ourselves. So it's always something that should uh, trigger some curiosity in you. And this video sh is showing changes to his baseline. And here's what we look for. There's an increase in uncertainty. There's a drop in confidence in one part of this video. There's a decrease in verbal fluency. Specifically, the changes here that are present are a shift in breathing, an increase in eye contact, and an increase in hesitancy, which is the uh, just the pausing before the answer. So great, we've identified a change, but what comes after change on the ch on this little five C's model? Next is context. In this instance, he's being asked his opinions and not hard facts. So an increase in uncertainty, hesitancy, and a decrease in fluency of language would be absolutely expected here because he's being asked his opinions and just to kind of deliver some conjecture here to speculate about the case. So we see that, but the moment we look at the context, we've, we spotted a change, but now we go to level two, context makes those behaviors more likely. That's all I got here, Scott. All right. Now for me, Greg, you, you're saying the one before this was the most important video from your point of view. From my point of view, this is the most important one because I think it tells us everything. This is where he starts that hard eye contact, making sure that guy believes him. That's why he's looking at him at, the, uh, at this point. Everything slows down here. His voice tone gets it gets lower. His cadence slows down. Everything gets everything starts slowing down here. It gets smaller. Um, and again, it's the most eye contact we've seen so far. And we do hear fading facts here at the end of that one sentence as he goes on. But I think that's more from an emotional standpoint. That's one of the things, Greg, earlier I kept looking. Did I put that in my notes? But I think it's because I'd seen that as an emotional thing and and not not from deception. I usually add that in deception. Now, when he starts talking about um, his theory, that's when we see that hard uh, head jerk over there to the left. He didn't. It wasn't a single shoulder shrug or anything like that. Usually that will come up and you'll see that jerk or they'll – go over that way, point their chin that way, and it comes up. But it was a hard one because I think that synapse in there, when that thought hit his brain, when he's thinking, I'm part of this, or I have seen this myself, that's why he keeps saying it's a theory. He keeps saying my theory, my theory, because he knows what happened. Either he saw it on the video stuff or the guy told him himself what happened. That's why he keeps reiterating the theory part. That's where I'd start digging in. That's where I'd go from being the, the nice guy. Hey, you know what's going on? You know, tell me about what. That's when I'd start turning into a to a, a meaner person, trying to get information uh, from from that point, put him on notice that I know something's up. That would be my approach in this one because something's up right here. He's letting us. He's he's telling that he knows what happened. Why would he keep saying my theory? My theory. You're right, Greg. He says my too much. My theory. My thing too much. And that that all of a sudden that head pop like that that's that's energy being expanded for no reason whatsoever except for a thought that's fired from a neurological standpoint a thought that's fired off and that that shocks him or, or doesn't shock him but it jerks him into hey man shoot this is it I think something's up here this is I think he's going to need I think my I think my theory my theory as to why he's doing this is because he's going to need to make a deal later. That's what it is. And he's holding this information back or something. But he's going to have to make a deal later. And that's that's what's going on here. He's either letting him know he's got this information and this is how he's going to do it. Instead of his lawyers going in saying he's got this information. This is just what I think. But that's what it looks like to me. Um, yeah. Okay. We good? Yeah. Dang, Chase. That's, that's smooth. Yeah. Very smooth. Nice. A little dramatic. A little colorful. Good. One of those tape replays. Doch Helge B. ist sich nach wie vor sicher. Christian Brückner hat die kleine Maddie entführt. Also, das ist jetzt meine Theorie. Meine. Ich kann, werde das, kann das ja den Christian ähm, jetzt äh, nicht ähm, unterstellen. Er ist ja in der Hinsicht noch unschuldig. Meine Theorie ist, dass er einen Einbruch vorhatte und dass halt irgendwie schief gegangen ist und er die Kinder halt im Apartment gefunden hat und dass er halt mehr die Mitte hat. Das ist meine Theorie. 
das war wahrscheinlich gar nicht geplant. Davon gehe ich mal stark aus, dass es nicht geplant war. Es war halt ein Zufall. Sie kennen, Sie kannten ihn ja. Sie haben dann diese Videos gesehen. Trauen Sie ihm so eine Tat zu? So eine Zufallstat? Ja, also so eine Tat würde ich ihm auf jeden Fall zutrauen, nachdem ich, nachdem jetzt, was ich alles über ihn weiß, ja, kann ich ihm so eine Tat auch zutrauen, ja. Noch mal einmal auf Ihr Gefühlsleben zurückkommen, dann sind wir auch fast fertig. Ähm, ich kann mir nicht vorstellen, wie es sich anfühlt, der wichtigste Zeuge in einem der bekanntesten Kriminalfälle der Welt zu sein. Wie fühlt sich das an? Schlecht. Also ich fühle mich nicht gut. Mir geht es nicht gut. Es hat meine Gesundheit beeinträchtigt. Ich habe zugenommen. Ich habe mal meine Phasen, wo ich am Durchdrehen bin. Ja. Ich habe Phasen, wo ich nächtelang nicht schlafe. Also es ist kein schönes Gefühl. Ne? Ich glaube, mit mir möchte da auch wohl keiner tauschen. Und immer so eine Art auf der Flucht zu sein. Das ist recht. kein richtiges Zuhause. Immer auf alles aufpassen, wem man was sagt. Wem man was erzählt. Ja. Also. Und die Freunde, Familie? Also Freunde habe ich keine mehr. Ne? Nee. Freunde habe ich jetzt gerade mehr. Ne? Bekannt. Aber Freunde, wahre Freunde habe ich nicht mehr. Ne? Mein letzter Freund ist im Oktober gestorben. Auf Korsika und ich durfte nicht mal zur Beerdigung. Also so traurig sieht mein Leben aus, ja. Am Ende des Interviews hat Helge B. noch ein Anliegen. Er möchte sich direkt an den Verdächtigen wenden. Christian, ich hoffe, dass du nicht mit dieser ganzen Geschichte einfach so davon kommst. Wenn doch, dann wäre es halt sehr traurig. Und glaub nicht, dass du denkst, dass ich die Videos nicht gesehen habe. Du leugnest es, dass es diese Videos nicht gibt, aber diese Videos hat es gegeben und ich habe sie gesehen. Und das kannst du mir glauben. Right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so watch him this time. His face is flushed. This is the most red we've seen his face in the entire time. As this interviewer is talking about how bad it must be. Watch him touch his face. That's new too. He's got all the earmarks of some reason that stress has started. His respiration is up. He's got short breaths. And by that, I don't mean it, they're shallow breaths. And Chase, you always talk about breathing in your chest, not in your abdomen. He's certainly breathing in his chest and it's affecting his speech. Shorter syllables, much tighter speaking. He touches his brow like the old stress headache medicines all show when a person's feeling stress headache. So there's something going on. And then we see disdain. We see that pullback. And Mark, I think you're brilliant when you say contempt is for people, disdain is for situations. And then he makes that hard eye contact. And then he sends this message, this well-prepared, everything about it is on straight down the tube. And he's given it everything. Everything about him is locked on. This is why he came here. This is what he came here to do. And this is here is one of two things. This is here to separate him from Bruckner or as a self-defense mode because something else is going on. I'll tell you what I think it is as we get to the end of these. Scott, what do you got? All right. Yeah, I, I agree with you on all that. Um, this the, he does the classic fist to face thing, and, but, and so much so that he's got his his thumb up on his ear, way up here, and push it on his face. That's called facial denting, or we refer to it as facial denting, and that's an adapter. He's trying to get rid of that built up stress and tension. He needs something to do there, and he's pushing so hard because he's thinking about this. This is important. You're right, Greg. This is this is where he's trying to get it apart, uh, get it across. And he's playing on the empathy of the interviewer, you know. So I, I, I think he's take, trying to take, ad, ad, attempting to take advantage of that in the situation. And you're right, his, like you said, his face is his face is flushed, and um, but I think that uh, adapter on his forehead. I think he, that's he, at the same time he's trying to recall something or, or paying attention to something he's saying as he structures what what he what's getting ready to what he's getting ready to say because he's got to watch his mouth here because this is this is it this is this is the the home run or the scoring part whatever you when you're you know in darts when you hit a, a bullseye or whatever he's got to hit that thing on this he's got to make sure it comes across clean um but, but again at the same time he's trying to be contained that's why we're seeing that 
that uh, fist come up on the face and it, that thumb touched the ear so hard. And he goes deep in there. So he's thinking, he's thinking there's a lot in there and he's, he's still trying to be contained. Um, that you covered most everything I, I got. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, Greg, I agree with you. There's some withholding going on here. Some self-control breathing into the chest. But uh, let's let's give some points in his favor. There's a positive and direct confrontation that he makes himself. He's willing to call somebody else a liar or a, a perpetrator. It's, there's an increase in openness and vulnerability in a way that displays, I think, truthful and non-scripted or forced behavior. There's an increase in openness and smoothness of nonverbal behavior. There's an increase in revealing and subject-focused language, specific language. So I think most of this is very truthful. Something's being hidden. And coming up next, I'm going to tell you precisely what I think, which I don't do very often, but I, I'll just tell you what I think is going on up after this. Uh, I don't know what these videos are 100% about, but I have no doubt that they exist. These videos, they're talking about these tapes or at least existed at one time. And it's incredible how wildly different uh, cultures are and languages. This behavior looks when somebody's being deceptive versus telling mostly the truth, no matter what language we're speaking. The behavior, uh, no matter what culture or country, has such a distinct difference that it shows that no matter what culture, we all have these same roots. We all come from the same place. And the only thing he really scored low on the statement analysis codex is the limited use of sensory details. But then we go to context, I think I might argue that there's no specific questions being asked about events where details might become relevant like that. So back to context. And the translation error in this one, he thinks he's not only capable but he believes that this guy is capable of fully doing everything. And he says the things that the guy found, uh, found the children and took Maddie just because it was a uh, accident. It was something that was just circumstantial for him that happened in the moment. Mark. Yeah. So uh, there's, I think true emotion in the friends. I don't have any more. I think that softening of the, of the voice um, almost a, a, a kind of a fading fact there. I think that's that's honest. There's a double shoulder shrug with that on the word nay, no. Um, so, so I think that's him being honest. What's interesting then is this juxtaposition with the performance that he has down the camera for uh, Bruckner of saying... Uh, so there's prolonged, prolonged eye contact. We haven't seen that with the interviewer. I mean, if, if anything is a is is an act this is an act this is well now's your moment to perform to the camera the message so why is this this element such a performed message uh, is this something he's been told to say is the what why is he rehearsed this so well why this bit down the camera uh you know if if the uh transcript that that i've looked at is is accurate the spirit of what he's saying is don't think that i haven't seen stuff you think that i haven't seen stuff don't think that i've seen stuff well that's kind of interesting isn't it because that's a direct that's a direct message to 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 brookner and he's got to sell that part of it what's that all about i'll give you some ideas uh later on that I think that's all I've got on that one. Have we had everybody? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Greg, okay. <laughs> man, you wanted that bad that time, Greg. You're you're in you're no, up in it, man. You're laser focused. Don't give me that. Yeah, that was it. You're into it, man. One of those tape replays. Noch mal auf ihr Gefühlsleben zurückkommen, dann sind wir auch fast fertig. Ähm Ich kann mir nicht vorstellen, wie es sich anfühlt. Der wichtigste Zeuge in einem der bekanntesten Kriminalfälle der Welt zu sein. Wie fühlt sich das an? Schlecht. Also ich fühle mich nicht gut. Ne? Mir geht's nicht gut. Ne? Es hat meine Gesundheit beeinträchtigt. Ich habe zugenommen. 
ich habe mal meine Phasen, wo ich am Durchdrehen bin. Ja. Ich habe Phasen, wo ich nächtelang nicht schlafe. Also es ist kein schönes Gefühl. Ne? Ich glaube, mit mir möchte da auch wohl keiner tauschen. Und immer so eine Art auf der Flucht zu sein. Das ist recht kein richtiges Zuhause. Immer auf alles aufpassen, wem man was sagt. Wem man was erzählt. Ja. Also. Und die Freunde, Familie? Also Freunde habe ich keine mehr. Nee. Freunde habe ich jetzt gerade mehr. Bekannt. Aber Freunde, wahre Freunde habe ich nicht mehr. Ne? Mein letzter Freund ist im Oktober gestorben, auf Korsika, und ich durfte nicht mal zur Beerdigung. Also so traurig sieht mein Leben aus, ja. Am Ende des Interviews hat Helge B. noch ein Anliegen. Er möchte sich direkt an den Verdächtigen wenden. Christian, ich hoffe, dass du nicht mit dieser ganzen Geschichte einfach so davon kommst. Wenn doch, dann wäre es halt sehr traurig. Und glaub nicht, dass du denkst, dass ich die Videos nicht gesehen habe. Du leugnest es, dass es diese Videos nicht gibt, aber diese Videos hat es gegeben und ich habe sie gesehen. Und das kannst du mir glauben. Just one more thing. Okay, what, what do you think we've seen so far? How's it looking to you? Yeah, I think what we've seen for a criminal who's confessing in front of his criminal community and the community he'd set up around him that probably didn't know that was his background, so he's losing all his friends. I don't think we see behaviors of concealment that are beyond what I would expect. I think we're seeing a good general level of uh, honesty from him. What do I think's happening here? I think the authorities need to set him up as a credible witness. And a credible witness without any evidence that they're going to be able to put in front of a jury, which means he needs to go in front of a jury and go, I saw images and here's what the images were. And that the jury would go, we don't need to see those in because they don't, we don't have, they're not, he threw them away. They're, they're in a lake somewhere, perhaps, uh, irretrievable. But your testimony is credible enough testimony that uh, we're putting a guy inside based on you saying that you saw images. I think if anything is being concealed, it may well be that gambit that's going on. That's just my strange opinion. Chase, what do you think you've seen so far? I've got a strange opinion, too. So. <laughs> I think there's a potential here that he might be involved in a little bit more than he's letting on here. And I think he may know more than he's letting on here. And I think those tapes might just be the beginning that they're referencing here. If you want to find out what the tapes are, you can look that up uh, on the Internet. However, if you would like a copy of this human made translation from a German with uh, all of the errors kind of corrected and all the paraphrasing and stuff put in there in a really organized way. I put a link down in the video description. If you want to click on that, you can download it right now, kind of go back through and have a little deeper understanding of what's going on. But uh, overall, he's honest, but that doesn't mean a lack of concealment. Those are different things. Greg? Yeah, I talk about a glass pane where a person is telling you what you need to hear for them to leave you alone. I think there's some of that going on. And I do think Scott, you say he's making a deal. I think the deal is bigger than that. I think the deal is with the public. Who knew who this guy was before last week? And suddenly, now I'm a guy, just random guy whose life has already gone to crap, but I could move. I could move. If, in fact, he has credible evidence that puts Madeleine McCann in the hands of Christian Bruckner and her being dead as a result of it, God, God bless her parents for all they've been through. If, in fact, that's the case, the first time we hear this guy's name is that he had evidence about Madeleine McCann for 20 years, 50, 10 years, and didn't let it out, and that he's a friend of this guy. So my opinion, what he's doing here, otherwise, why would he get in front of the public? Mark, it has to be either yours or mine, I think. He came out and said, let me separate myself from this guy. And he has to protect how he got the information, how he knows it. We know the Germans have said they have credible evidence that Madeleine McCann is not alive. 
credible evidence. Okay, what is that credible evidence? It's likely coming from him. And the last thing he wants to do is to not have any control, any control over the narrative while he's sitting in a court being asked questions and being able to say yes or no or yes or no and being torn apart by cross. So I think it's him up front coming out, trying to rescue himself before this becomes the issue and he becomes partner number two in one of the most horrific crimes and the thing that's at front of mind for almost all people on the globe. That's what I think. Scott, what do you think? I agree with you. Yeah. I think everything you guys have said, it all wraps up into, into the, and into what's going on here. I think it is part of the thing for the public. I think it is part of the thing for the case coming up because he's a criminal. This is not a good guy at all. Not even a little bit. And he's got to come on like, Oh, I've got this information I've given. I'm giving up for you. That's where the deal I'm talking about comes in. He's got to make a deal with the cops first, I think, or the government, whoever runs their, their thing. So I think that's what's going. That's what we're seeing here. And I think we've seen from the beginning to the end here him go through and tr- and that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to to show, oh, I'm I'm you know yeah of course I've done some bad things too you know because I saw these videos and did this and that. Well, I b- wouldn't be surprised if he was part of some of that. So from where I'm from my uh, uh, approach or opinion because he's h- how birds of a feather man they. He's hanging out with this guy, but he just happens to see these videos. And then I agree, maybe it was because of the context of the or what was happening in the videos was was uh, dealing with a different type of person than the other videos we're dealing with. And when he saw the ones that were dealing with the with the other type of person, that's when he said, "And oh, no, this is going to end." I don't think he's that good a guy. People who traffic people aren't good people at all. They're the worst. So I don't think he has any heart. I don't think he has any heart felt feelings for any of the victims of this at all. I think he's in it for himself. And I think that will, and I don't think it's going to work because I think other people are going to be able to see what I'm seeing and what we're seeing in this and say, Oh, I see what's happening here. I I, I think he, this is the last ditch effort for him to try to dig himself out of this hole he's in because the cops know he was there. That's, that's, I think that's what we're seeing uh, here. That's the way it looks to me. All right, fellas. Thanks. This was another good. And then we'll see you next time. So what do you got?